Hello there. Sorry, I haven't made many videos in the past couple of days. I have a friend visiting from up north. He's he's staying in a motel around the corner. I don't have a bed for him to stay, so don't blame me for that one. Um, but uh, that's where I've been. I realized though the six thousand six thousand five hundred plus videos I've made that I've not specifically addressed this, and I had several people recently ask me about it, which is kind of weird. When someone asks a question about something odd or whatever, they'll all ask in groups. There'll be another person a few days later. So I have to talk about uh, gravitational time dilation. People will say, you know, why is it when light approaches, you know, a large mass, i.e. a source of gravitation, time slows down? Now, or, um, of course, Nikola Tesla attacked, vehemently attacked, uh, Einsteinian relativity because it is bunk, because relativity is very core. Um, by denying the ether, which of course is completely impossible, reifies space as having properties. And the only thing, it's not my opinion, it's a fact, the only thing Nikola Tesla attacked the hell out of was uh, Einstein's notion that space has properties and it acts upon other things and it does other things. But we're not discussing uh, Tesla and Einstein in this video. But about gravitational time dilation. And the answer is really simple. I've told many people countless times before, and I meet people and they love this analogy. I said, you know, Mother Nature is not, you know, a nerdy chick, you know, with a calculus calculator and a slide rule. You know, she's a, a dirty, a dirty feet and uh, dreadlocks and hairy armpit chick. And the only thing she understands is pressure mediation. So expanding upon and explaining gravitational time dilation, specifically analogously in observations with light, and also, too, they tested gamma. But, of course, gamma radiation is also light. So I think other than high energy light, we'll actually approach it from that aspect, too. But it's also true that if it's just two masses that are accelerating, and they're not accelerating, as I've explained many times, never towards one another, but towards a null pressure point in counter space, which seems like a distinction without a difference, but it's actually an incredibly important difference that gravitational time dilation is explained rather easily. Let me first give the uh, heretical explanation or uh, minor dissertation of this. In general relativity is considered to be a difference in the passage of proper time at different positions as described by a metric tensor. I love that one. A metric tensor of space-time. The existence of gravitational time dilation was first confirmed directly by the pound reb cut experiment in 1959. Well, Let's talk about what does happen, and we don't have to talk about bodies, we can simply talk about light in relationship to a mass. Um, and this is confirmed by, and I'll agree on this first aspect with any and all scientists, because it's been confirmed through multiple, multiple observations and experimentations over and over again, that traveling away from a mass, um, redshift occurs, which of course means greater uh, magnitude and therefore greater time. Now, I don't know if you know much about EMR, or uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation, um, but redshift has a much greater spatial volume. We're also, too, really addressing the same thing as Doppler effect, compression and rarefaction, and uh, rarefaction is the dissipation of energy, but also, too, when, and I will be 100% in agreement with all the scientists out there that have uh, shot gamma radiation, and they've actually done many frequencies, but specifically gamma radiation because it's easier, to actually quantify with measuring instruments that when uh, gamma is shot away from a mass or magnitude that it actually has measurable decrease in energy and it also too red shifts but of course red shifting of any frequency of electromagnetic radiation is lower capacitance so measured in electrovolts red spectrum light is much less energetic and has much less energy than blue shift light does but red shift light has an enormous spatial volume relative to blue shift. So just think about this again, because this is incredibly important. You need to picture it in your mind. You'll understand it really simply, and then I'll explain it even simpler than that, because if you don't understand Mother Nature and how simple she is, all of this stuff is easily convoluted by the cult of quantum who believes in atomism, because they believe in photons and other uh, nonsensical absurdities, which Nikola Tesla and countless other experts in field theory said was nonsense. As light, whether it be um, visible light or gamma radiation, travels away from a mass, not only does it lose energy, 
but it redshifts. But what happens when any light, whether that be gamma or otherwise, redshifts? Its spatial volume increases, but its energy decreases. Now, what else have I talked about in thousands and thousands of videos is uh, the very definition of increasing force and motion, and centrifugal, centrifugal divergence, and literally, we can say creating space and magnetism are the exact same things. That magnetism, creating space, well, I just said the same thing. When something creates space, it's actually dissipating energy, it's creating, and that's of course is what a three-dimensional force vector is, which I've also too explained in at least a thousand different videos. Now what happens when we do the inverse? We actually um, direct uh, light, and specifically they tested gamma radiation, uh, towards the mass. What happens is that it blue shifts. Not only does it blue shift, but it increases, yeah, it increases its energy. And you know what else happens? They call it gravitational time dilation, but what happens, and this has been observed and, um, and uh, the experiment redone countless times, is this gravitational time dilation, whether that be away from a mass or towards a mass, towards a mass, I said mass, towards a mass, what happens? And why does it happen? Time increases of the light going away, and time decreases as the light approaches a mass and a magnet. We say mass that has a magnitude. This is why black holes confuse people, by the way. It's a supermass with no magnitude, because dielectricity has overthrown its ability to keep it within the physical universe. Yes? So let's go over that again. When gamma or light, of course gamma is light, travels away from a mass, it redshifts, it increases in spatial volume, and its energy dissipates. It increases in volume, yeah? When you shoot gamma or any other form of light towards a mass, it blue shifts, yes, its energy increases, and time decreases. Now let's explain this in really, really simple terms, exactly like Mother Nature would like us to do, or what we would call natura naturans. Of course, there's no real physical Mother Nature, but like I said, she's a, she's a dreadlock chick with muddy feet and a hemp skirt and hairy armpits, right? It's kind of funny, but it's true. Um, the people of quantum and of relativity and uh, the folks in academia want you to think Mother Nature's a nerdy chick with a calculus, uh, you know, one of those uh, graphing calculators in her pocket and a slide rule in the other, but that's not what she is at all. She only understands force of motion, inertia, acceleration, and pressure mediation. Gravity, wait for it, Here's, this is a really difficult, because no scientist today, if you come up to any scientist in academia and say, what's a field? Say, I'm going to put you on the spot, it's not a trick question, what's a field? I, I tell you this undeniably that not a single one of them will be able to give you an answer. Not a single one. This field, as I've explained very simply, is an ether perturbation modality. Kind of like uh, ice and steam are just different temperature and pressure modalities of water. They're all one and the same thing. This is how simple, I mean, how difficult it is. Gravity is what we call gravity, which of course is um, non-point source mutual mass acceleration, or the dissipation of force in motion, that's all gravity is. It's a move towards counter space. And a move towards counter space, or the inverse of space, is anti-time. Let me repeat that in a conventional fashion, just like a field is an ether perturbation modality. I can't believe I've not said this in any videos. I've said it in a roundabout fashion. But gravity is, of course, necessitatively and logically so, and irreducibly anti-time. Repeat it just one more time. Gravity is anti-time. Well, why is it anti-time? Divergent magnetic field is, of course, the creation of space. Magnetism is, by definition, in full refulgence, the toroidal force vector, yeah, the three-dimensional force vector, which, of course, extrapolates itself as a toroid, the creation of space. And when we have space, we have mass and magnitude. When we have mass and magnitude, we have time, because time is not a thing itself. Time is a measure of mass and magnitudes and their mutual passing. Time does not exist at all, ultimately. It only exists conventionally. This is the reason why every ancient wise culture said that time is the number four. They all said that. Also, too, I think it's the ancient Japanese and Chinese. The word for four means death. The reason why the word for four means death is because people burn and die in time. There's the ancient answer between behind the Chinese, the ancient metaphysics of the Chinese and Japanese behind that word four, meaning death. Because when you burn in time, you die in time. But time, being the number four that it is, because every ancient culture of true wisdom, both Greek and Indian and Egyptian, said that time is the number four. 
And time is the only number not present within the first five digits of the Fibonacci sequence. Go look up the Fibonacci sequence. What's the only number missing between 1 and 5 in the Fibonacci sequence? It goes 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. What's the only number missing? 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. Principle, attribute, uh, magnitude, mass, and man. When I say man, I mean ontos, or being. Time is the only number not present there. Number four. I'll let you actually consider the uh, metaphysical and philosophical reifications of that, but that's not what this video is about. Anyway, gravity is anti-time. Divergent magnetic field is, of course, the creation of space. Spatial mass and magnitude is, of course, the measure of time. Time exists, like I said, many, many, countless times. Haha, ha, there's a joke in there somewhere. Time does not exist ultimately. It exists conventionally. Time is only the measure of mass and magnitude. Time, in other words, is the, uh, is the, uh, the child, or the grandchild, actually, of a, a divergent magnetic field. And a move towards increasing inertia and acceleration towards counter space is the erasure of that conventional time, because time is conventional only. This is the reason why, under, and I'm in full agreement with scientists upon this, that their descriptions and observations and experiments are accurate. Their explanations, and their explanation is relativity, which is wrong, because descriptions are not explanations. Well, these scientists have done this experiment many times. You're right, and their observations are accurate, but their explanations are wrong. It has nothing to do with relativity. It has nothing to do with bending curved space. Or as they call it, they call it a metric tensor of space-time curvature. No, it's not. Mother Nature doesn't work like that. Mother Nature only works in pressure mediation. Explaining gravitational time dilation is incredibly simple. Mass and magnitude, a magnetic field, the after effect of which is time, and decreasing mass and magnitude, or a move towards counter -space. This is the reason why gamma and light shot towards a mass. Yes, it always blue shifts, it always increases in energy, and time shrinks. Instead of it dilating, it constricts. EMR towards a mass causes temporal constriction. Um, light or gamma shot away from a mass causes temporal dilation because one is inertia and acceleration and the other one's force and motion. Magnetism, dielectricity. Magnetism, dielectricity. It is that simple. Gravity, or what we call gravity, because gravity is not an autonomous fuel modality. It is another, uh, nothing other than uh, dielectric acceleration, specifically non-point source mutual mass acceleration. You know, you put your hands in a box that you got, a package, and you pull out and those little styrofoam beads are stuck to your hand. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? There's no difference between that so-called electrostatic cling and so-called gravity. There's absolutely zero difference whatsoever. Absolutely no difference. Measure implies directly magnetism. And when you have measure, you have mass. And with one exception, a black hole. There we have a mass with no uh, measure and no magnitude. So anyway, when you have measure, we have dielectric. Um, excuse me, we have uh, magnetism. Excuse me. Sorry about that. I'm always thinking about 10 things at once. When we have measure, we actually have uh, centrifugal divergence. We have the after effect of a divergent magnetic field, which of course is space. And space, mass, and magnitude being synonymous, we have therefore thence time. Or as the ancient uh, Buddhist said, when this is present, that is present. When this is not present, that is not present. Magnetism implies directly time. And what's the inverse of magnetism? Actually, it's not the inverse because magnetism is the dielectric field. But the inverse of centrifugal force and motion, i.e. centrifugal divergence, is dielectricity. What we call gravity, I don't care if you call it gravity or electrostatic cling, it doesn't matter. It's all one and the same thing. It is a move towards increasing inertia and acceleration. They move towards counter space. Where energy increases, light and gamma, and gamma is light. It's nothing other than high energy light. Yes, it blue shifts, and time constricts. Since time is measure of mass and magnitude, it, of course, dilates as mass and magnitude increase. And that's also, too, a reason why gamma and light red shifts, leaving a mass, or shot away from a mass. So... Believe it or not, the explanation for gravitational time dilation is really, really simple. And even though it took me like 20 minutes to get around to it because I had to give analogies and whatnot and so on forth, explaining why time, 
uh, dilation occurs. And of course, you can look this up. Um, you know, when traveling away from uh, a mass, it'll always redshift, and traveling away, uh, traveling towards a mass, it'll always blue shift. Um, they actually call this gravitational redshift, but the gravitational redshift is only in relationship to the uh, uh, the EMR that's uh, shot away from the mass or the magnitude, mass or magnitude, one of the same thing. Um, they should call it specifically gravitational redshift because we're talking about increasing inertia and acceleration, but it's called gravitational redshift. But that's only a relationship to it uh, leaving, because it's traveling away from it, and it always uh, redshifts, and uh, uh, the energy dissipates, and of course the volume increases, because red spectrum and light and redshifting implies, and does mean, great increase in mass and volume, because red, even red light, we're talking about visible light, we could just use visible light, for example. Red light is enormous in volume compared to blue light, but blue light has a lot more energy. Because the way Mother Nature works is the smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. Which is opposite to how human beings think. You know, if you've got a larger box, it can hold more stuff. Well, Mother Nature's box... <laughs> Mother Nature's natural box there... Well, it still doesn't sound right. Mother Nature's box, the smaller it is, the more it can hold. There's a joke in there somewhere, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> anyway, I hope you like this video. Because I simplified something that nobody else on YouTube or any other internet channel has ever done before. And it is really just that simple. You don't have to embrace relativity. You don't have to embrace um, metric tensors of space-time, which is completely ludicrous. And I will remind you once again, the one time in his life that we know of, for, for certain, that Nikola Tesla fumed at the mouth, not literally, but close to it, was in relationship to relativity and specifically Einstein's uh, uh, anti... Uh, and Einstein originally believed in the ether, but later he rejected it. Einstein's notion uh, that space has properties. Because it doesn't have properties. It has attributes, but no properties. Anyway, thanks for watching. Goodbye.